So far today, uh, you've seen the uh, caliber of the uh, average Alabama high school student and the, uh, the caliber of the average marketing guy uh, in the Scala community. And uh, now you're going to find out what level of ability it takes to not yet qualify to graduate from college in Australia. Uh, this is Ambrose Bonaire Sargent. He is uh, completing his degree uh, uh, at the University of Western Australia. And this is his first time in the United States. This is his first time ever meeting another closure programmer in the flesh. How cool is that? Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about logic programming, which is an amazing catch fire uh, part of the closure world right now. It's, it's so exciting to have uh, crowds of people who are jumping onto logic programming and on the work that he's done with tutorials and the work that David Nolan and others have done with Core Logic. So thank you, Ambrose, and welcome. Thanks. Is that okay? Can everyone hear me? It's all good? Yeah? Okay, so who's done any logic programming here? Show of hands. So how about core.logic? Anyone looked at that? No. Yes? Cool. And then, did anyone write Mini Canron in here? <laughs> oh, yeah. So we have a special treat here this year. We've got um, Friedman and Bird, <laughs> Dan Friedman and William Bird. And, um, They've got something really cool. Uh, they want to present their constraint canon. And if you get anything out of this talk, um, make sure you go see them after. Uh, I think it's tonight at 6 o'clock. So yeah, follow them around. They'll be presenting their latest project. So logic programming. So what I'll be covering here, I'll be covering some fundamental logic pro programming concepts, which you can kind of see as an extension of functional programming. And um, so I'll be making sure we all understand what, what we have already with functional programming. So, and then we'll cover what general implementation characteristics a logic, programming a logic programming language has, and we'll use that information to gain an understanding of the execution model of core.logic. So what I, I got here on Monday night, and a lot of people were like, great, I've, I've tried core.logic, but I have no idea what what is going on? I can see that this is happening, but why? So I'm, I'm trying to cover that kind of ground. So in functional programming, we have our pure functions. So some pretty obvious things, but they're worth pointing out. Um, functions always have one value. They're what we call deterministic. So yeah, we always get one value for our input arguments. And another fairly obvious thing, which seems odd to point out, is that Functions only work for one pattern of input and output arguments. So what do I mean by that? So I basically mean that the inputs are the arguments or the parameters, and the output is the return value. And that seems pretty fundamental to something like a function. But, OK, so functions, they seem like they can do everything, but sometimes they're inappropriate. So look at this interesting problem here. Um, normally when we have a square root function in language, we get, I think it's the, the primary root or the, the main root. Uh, so here we, we're asking the question, for, well, we, we say that 4 has two square roots, positive 2 and negative 2. And to represent that return value with a function, we have to return a list of values. So that's kind of a, a bit of a hack. If you think about it, it's an interesting thing to think about. And even more interesting is that if you divide a number by 0, that it really yields no result. And another kind of hack um, is to you know, throw an exception. So these are the types of things that are interesting when we look at um, um, uh, logic programming. Because when we introduce a relation, a relation can return any number of results, or it can generate any number of results, as we'll see. And so any number is zero or more, so it covers the cases I've, I've looked at. And um, that behavior is, is known as non-deterministic behavior. So we're not always returning one result. We don't really know how many results it could return. And the pattern of input and output arguments for a relation can be different for each call. So the, the parameters are no longer just for input. They're also for output, which is it's interesting. It sounds pretty evil, but we'll see how it works. <laughs> so a concrete, um, well, a kind of concrete definition of a relation. In mathematics, the expression x, r, y is true if x and y satisfy the relation r. So let's see this. Uh, x is less than y. So there are 
four ways this less than relation can be considered. So this first way, we can consider it as a generator of the infinite set of xy pairs for which x is less than y. So if we think of xy as being um, as outputs here, so it can generate all these outputs. So if, we, if x, y are, are both inputs, if they're both um, ground values or numbers, and I'll define that later on, uh, we can use it as a predicate. We can say x is less than y. And we also have the two more specific cases of generators. If we give an x, it'll yield all the values of y that are greater than x and vice versa. So just syntactically, if we want to, we want to convert a function to a relation, uh, there's, uh, there's one main thing that, that we have to look for. So you can see here that we always return, well, conceptually we return a Boolean value uh, from a relation. A relation will either succeed or it'll fail. So in my little made up language, this, this isn't core dot logic by the way, this is just my illustration that um, uh, relations can succeed or fail. So a relation returns true if the relation is true and false if the relation is false. So you can see that we've lost the ability of treating this as an actual value, so as a, um, as a return value. So what we do is we move it to an output parameter. So what's that funny looking O, that superscript O? So basically it, it, show, it tells you that that is a relation. It's a cons relation. So one example of using this cons relation is, at a, is as a predicate. So if all the arguments are ground values, so if they're not variables, we can use it to see if a head and a tail, if a head cons onto a tail uh, equals the, uh, the return value. So you could describe the cons relation with this kind of documentation string. And it, it, it kind of, it's like a constraint. So we say for, for cons of head, tail, and result, Conzo returns true if head cons onto tail equals result. So head cons onto tail equal result, true. Head cons onto tail, no, so that's false. So another use of conzo is as a generator of values. So here uh, we, we have to introduce the idea of a query here because we're, we want to know the value of a logic variable after um, after execution. So the idea is that um, this, this argument here is our output. So the relation will fill in any, any arguments that need to be filled in such that the relation is satisfied. So to satisfy this particular relation, so the head, head cons onto the tail equals that. So what uh, the, the conzo does is it generates, um, it basically binds x to uh, this value here. Now, this is the actual value here, but what, what's with this, this list of values? So this is how we represent a non-deterministic result. So we can, remember, relations can return zero or more results, so we need to present it in some way, and this is how we can do it. And the way we control the number of results we return is with that number, the solve one. So you can read this as, give me one value of x such that the cons of one and the vector of two equals x. So let's go back to our square root example. Here's an example of a relation that will generate two different values. So we say that, give me two values of x such that the square root of four equals x. And we can see that we've got our two results here. All right, so how do we implement this stuff? So logic language usually calculates zero or more results. So this, is, this seems more flexible than, than most traditional languages. So it's non-deterministic. So the execution strategy must be more flexible. So basically, it's implemented as a search. We search for an answer. Do we have enough answers? No, let's go search for more. Do we have enough? Yes, now, now we return. So the first thing to understand with, an ex with the execution strategy of a logic language is this concept of a branch or a, a choice point. So a choice point groups together a set of alternative statements. And if visualized as a tree, they are the branching nodes. So you can see that the red root, uh, root node there is basically a, um, a branch. So it's like a conditional in a conventional language. But we'll see how it differs. Um, and this is similar to a conditional 
in that if an alternative is found to be wrong later on, then another one is picked. So if we go down a branch and we see it's wrong, then we choose another. So it's kind of similar to the conditionals we're used to. So how do we say that a branch is wrong? So we have this concept of a failure. So each node, each node we have here is a separate statement. You can think of it as a relation. Each one of these is a relation. So if we come across a relation that represents this failure statement, then this whole branch can be considered wrong or false. And, or at least you don't, you don't care about it anymore, so you might as well get rid of it. So what do you do when you come across a fail point? So that indicates we backtrack to a choice point and try another alternative. So we go back and then we go back down and find another alternative. So what happens if we don't come across a failure? So if we get to the end of a branch, that represents one valid result, or if we come across a leaf node. And that contributes one result to our non-deterministic result. So remember, we, we represent our non-deterministic result as a list, so that'll be one entry in our list. So if another result is requested, we backtrack to a choice point and execute another alternative statement. And of course, we do this until we, we've satisfied how many results we want. So remember, we said solve for two values of x. Give me two values of x. So we see we've got one value, two values. All right, that's good enough. We won't go down the third branch. All right, so one, one way to, uh, to approach an implementation that does this is, is with um, encapsulated search. So relational programs, so what I mean by relational programs is, um, is a logic program consisting of purely relations. Uh, and they can potentially execute in many different ways. And we want to be able to control which choices are made and when they are made. So one way we can uh, control the choices that are made is controlling the search strategy. So before we saw a depth first search, although it wouldn't really matter in the, the last example. But um, you can think of other search strategies, so your, your normal breadth first search. And, and there are some other ones that are particularly useful in logic languages. And you also want to be able to control the amount of results. Because if you imagine, if you asked, remember the less than relation, it generated the infinite set of numbers that x are less than y. So unless you can put a cap on that, um, it, this is fairly useless. So yeah, the, the, that's a, a, a requirement. So one approach to this is to execute a relational program with encapsulated search in a kind of environment which controls which choices are made and when they are made. And another, another requirement is that it protects the rest of the environment from side effects of choices. So basically, what I mean is, if you go down a branch, you don't want the side effects of one branch polluting the other branch. So you, we want to be able to go back in time and undo any, any bindings that are made to logic variables. So one, one way to implement this is with a, an extremely functional approach. So we can protect the, from the effects of choices by representing states by a substitution. So we can protect from side effects. So it's basically this pattern of, of putting state through via functions instead of having global state. So a substitution is like a list of identity value pairs for logic variables. So it's like the variable v has value one or the variable a is unbound. So it's just, it's a world, it's a snapshot. So how do we get these states? So we have these, these things called goals and you can think of them as the next state functions. So what goals do? They take the current world or a substitution and they return a lazy list of zero or more substitutions. And uh, an, uh, an example of using goals is a relation. Re relations are usually implemented as goals. So we can control which choices are made by different monadic strategies. And these are best visualized by search trees. And they're extremely, extremely hard to get your head around. I certainly have not. And you could you know, give depth first search. And there's this idea of interleaving search as well, which is it's just good to know that it exists. Uh, once you get used to logic programming, it's, it's good to get back to this concept. But, uh, and this idea of controlling the number of results, um, say I want two values of x. So that is, um, if everything is lazy, you just say, oh, give me, give me three results. And you just take it and, yeah. So that, that would be the approach there. It's implement, implemented with laziness. So. I think I'll just have a drink. <laughs> so
So we've seen enough to check out some core logic and might make some sense out of it. <laughs> so, what are the things that characterize core logic? So it's non-deterministic. We can gather zero or more results. It uses substitutions, which remember was the, uh, our, our state uh, represented as a, a snapshot. And it uses goals to get our next states. And um, it's, it's that whole monadic uh, functional uh, implementation that I, I kind of hand, hand wave my way through. And two things you need to know is that queries are done. It's not the solve uh, form that I saw before, but it's, it's run. And another quirk is that if a variable is unbound at the end of execution, it's, it's represented by one of these funny underscore dot incrementing integer things. So if you see one of those things, it just basically means, say we wanted two values of Q, and you come across one of these underscore dot zero, it says that Q is unbound at this result. And we'll see what that means. So there are two fundamental goals, uh, succeed and fail. And succeed's fairly easy. It's like a, a no op or a no operation. It doesn't do anything. All it basically does is pass along the current state. So you give it a state and it just pushes it along. So if we visualize the, the flow of substitutions by a tree, we can say the initial substitution is, is the world where Q is unbound, because remember we have our, our Q. So basically, um, a query implicitly initializes that Q to an unbound variable. Then we come across our succeed, and it's a leaf node because there's no more goals to execute. And then we come across our, our, um, our leaf node substitution. And great, we've got one value. We don't need to look for any more. And the reason that this is underscore dot zero is that this will be unbound. And if we look at the fail, remember the fail indicates that the current branch is wrong. So we've got the same idea here. Initial substitution is where Q is unbound. We, find, we go to our next statement, and th th it's a fail. So our current branch is wrong. So what do we do? We go back to our last choice point and, um, and execute the next branch. But obviously, there's no branches here. So um, basically, we just, there are zero results. So we cannot, we, there are no values that uh, we can extract from a, from a run. So a very important goal is unification. This equals equals function is not the closure dot core slash equals equals. It's it's pronounced unify, and it basically it takes two arguments, and so unification answers the question: What must the world look like for the left and right arguments to be equal? And if it can make the left and right arguments equal, it'll find the next world, uh, the next snapshot such that both are equal. So you can see. In our run, we want one value of Q such that one is, uh, is unified with Q. So we come across this an initial substitution, Q is unbound, and we ask, what must the world look like for one for, to equal to Q? And then we come across our leaf node, uh, and what uh, unification does, it, it spits out the next world state where Q is equal to one, because that is a world where the left is equal to right or one is equal to Q. And you can see, it's kind of like, assignment, except it doesn't matter, because it's more general than assignment. So how do we introduce more than one logic variable? So we have our one logic variable from the query, our, say, query logic variable. So we also have a, uh, a goal called fresh. And it's basically syntactically like let, except it, it doesn't have pairs of things. It just has names. So, and it basically, it's like let. It, it uh, delimits the scope of the logic variable. And um, if you've come from prologue, this is kind of weird. It's like, because um, in prologue, to introduce a new logic variable, you just give a, uh, you start off the logic, you just start off the name of the variable with an A. Uh, sorry, a capital letter. And you can see this is kind of seems uh, a bit lower level, but, there is, I'm, I'm not really sure, I won't go on about that. I won't pretend like I, I know anymore. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, a similar, similar idea. So how do we define choice points? So cond E is syntactically similar to schemes cond. So 
what closuresCon uh, does is get rid of the redundant grouping parentheses around uh, the question and the answer of each clause. But Cond is special in that it can have multiple answers. So suddenly the grouping parentheses aren't redundant anymore. So we can have, uh, yeah, so the, the, the idea is that we can have one uh, exactly one answer, for, uh, one question for each clause, and zero or more answers. So, here's an example of a slightly involved execution. So, let's look at the, uh, the rep true representation of what we're doing. So, basically, you can think of uh, we're always executing the, the nodes of the branches on the left first. So what happens is we get to the our red um, choice point, we go, we choose our first branch, and we haven't come across a failure. So we get our leaf node, great, one out of two results. So we we have we need two. So we go back to our last choice point, we go down the next branch. Look, it's a failure. So it's saying that this branch is invalid. So we go back to our last uh, choice point, we go down the next branch, and we come across our um, our next answer, and we say, great, we've got two out of two, we don't need to execute anymore. So if we follow along with this conditional, you can see that here is the, the first branch, this is the next branch, this is the next branch, and this is the last branch. So the first branch unifies Q with one, and you can see that this uh, accounts for this one here. Because it's a leaf node, you can imagine that this is a substitution that binds Q to one. So we extract the value of Q from the substitution, and here it is. So we backtrack, go to our, um, our next branch. The question is succeed, that's not a failure, so we'll keep on going, and that we come across fail. So this tells us our whole branch is wrong. Uh, so we backtrack and go to succeed, uh, sorry, we go to the next branch, and this is where we find our next, uh, our next answer. So here we have two out of two, and you can see, remember succeed is, uh, it does not change the current uh, environment. So this accounts for the uh, unbound, the, the unbound value of Q. So remember, we, we want the value of Q at, at this point, and because it hasn't changed, this is the answer. It's unbound. So. Here's some real code in core logic, and I've done something kind of quirky. I've, in, I've represented numbers as lists, so you can see I define zero as zero, and one as zero with a with a list around it, and then you can imagine two is one with a list around it. And oh, sorry, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I'm going to use this representation to illustrate some. Uh, to, to walk through some code. So you can see we're using our successor, well, I'll, I'll explain the implementation first. So the successor function takes a previous number and a next number, the p and n. And you can see it has a doc string, which is very much like a constraint. p and n are natural numbers such that n is the, the successor of p. And the reason I say it's like a constraint is because if this goal succeeds, you can guarantee that this, this doc string will be true. So so if it doesn't, right, if, if the goal doesn't return false, then, um, then P and N will be natural numbers, and then the uh, N, is, N will be the successor of P. Right. So you can see this in action here. We, we're saying I want one value of Q such that the successor of zero is Q. And that relation is true when Q is one. So you can remember in your mind, Remember, this uh, represents our non-deterministic result. So there's one value of Q. So we've got uh, one here. And we can use this backwards, which is pretty cool. <laughs> we can say, give me one value of Q such that the successor of Q is one. And of course, that's when Q is zero. So we can use this successor function to represent all the natural numbers, which is uh, all the numbers from zero and, and positive. So the, the constraint, our doc string, says that x is a natural number. So if the goal succeeds, that means that x is a natural number. You can, you can bank on it. 
So if we look at the implementation, you can see there are two branches. The first branch is our base case, where x is 0. And the second branch, it says there is a, a number called previous, such that previous is a natural number. So you can see that this is the recursive case. And you can imagine we keep on going until we, we get to where this is 1, and then, uh, sorry, where, when previous will be 0, we'll get to our base case. So it's, it's, it looks similar to, to code we've seen before, like structurally. So the way to use this natural number, we can use it as a predicate. We can say, does, uh, remember this is the list of 0. And we can say, give me one value, to, value of q such that 1 is a natural number. And that doesn't, you don't need to change the world. So q is unbound, so that's successful. Now this is interesting. Give me six values of q such that q is a natural number. We've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So we're going to see how this works. So we've got our representation of the current code here the actual code that's being executed, and I've just highlighted the, the current branch we've taken in orange, and the current result that we're accounting for, I've highlighted in orange in, in that box. So this, this one's the easy case. This is the, the base case. So we basically come across our choice point, and we, we go down our first branch, and it says unify q with 0, and q is, q is unbound at that point. Um, because if we look at the query, uh, at the start of a, a query, um, Q, our query logic variable is unbound. So we, the way to unify Q with 0 is by um, binding Q to 0. And you can see, if we look at our tree, uh, that is a leaf node. So we've got one answer. So what do we do when we come across an answer? We say, have we got enough answers? No. We want six answers. So we backtrack to our we go back in time to our last um, choice point. So if we go down our other, uh, go down the other branch, remember there was a call to natural number. All this is, I've just expanded out the call to natural number. And it should look familiar as the base case and the recursive case. So what's happened? We've come across another choice point. So we, we take the first one, which is the, the base case. So this is, this is interesting. We say that, remember, Q is unbound at this point because we've gone back in time. We're, we're, now, um, we're now at this uh, successor node here, which is the success of previous equals Q. Now, Q isn't, isn't anything. Q is just unbound. And previous isn't anything either. So we're just kind of remembering that, OK, I, we know that there's a relation between previous and Q, but they're both unbound at this point. But if you can see. Our next goal says that we unify previous with zero. So we've got some more information. Uh, previous is zero, so therefore Q is one. And that, that accounts for our second answer, where Q is one. So we can repeat this exercise, and you can see that there are now two successes. The first successor. Um, says that previous is the number before q, and then we say previous is the number before previous 2, and now previous 2 is 0, therefore previous is 1, and q is 2, and that should be the, the third answer that we get. And you get the point. How long have we got? Oh. So, uh, the rest of this talk would just be me having a bit of fun showing you something cool. <laughs> so this is, I think uh, David Nolan wrote this, uh, and he got it off some old prologue. Oh no, it, it was a Stack Overflow answer that was just randomly this implementation of this type checker, and uh, David saw, thought it was pretty cool, and he uh, implemented it in a in an impure style, so we couldn't. Um, we couldn't do what, what I'm about to show you. So I, I kind of, I pestered him and he, he gave me this implementation so I could play around with it. So this is a type checker for the simply typed lambda calculus. So all you need to know about simply typed lambda calculus is that a function takes exactly one argument. So if you want a function with two arguments, 
you take a fun you take a function with one argument and you wrap it in another function that takes one argument. So the main the engine of this type checker is this type D O. So it's a, you, you'll see by the end why it's so hard to name these things. Like I, I'm just going to say this is type determine O. It's, it's good enough. So we can see the uh, the doc string says that context is an environment such the, that the expression exp is executed in the environment context and that results in type result type. So that's a bit, it's probably easier just to see an example. So we can use this type checker as a type checker, obviously, because that's what it is. First argument is an environment. And the way you read that environment, f is of type, uh, it's a function, takes an integer and returns an integer. And there's also another uh, entry in the environment that says g is of type integer. We have our expression, which is in blue, and I just made up, uh, well, I guess David made, made up a, a arbitrary syntax for function application. You just have a vector, say apply f to g, and that's basically um, f is the function and g is the argument. And this third argument is the type that we want the, the, uh, the expression to, to be. So if, if this goal succeeds, then apply fg in the context of that environment will be of type integer. And if you follow it through, that's true, because f t first argument is an integer, g is an integer, you know, f returns an integer, and you can see that we don't need to uh, modify the value of q. And the, the goal succeeds anyway. So we get this uh, funny unbound uh, thing. So what happens if we get rid of this integer here and make it and put an unbound logic variable? So you can see now, you can see the, uh, the utility of, of relations being able to treat arguments as inputs or outputs. So we're basically saying, give me one value of q such that apply fg in the current environment is equal to q. And we've already seen that the, the third argument has to be an integer. So q is unified with integer uh, somewhere inside this goal. Because remember the constraint of this goal said that, yeah, I've, I've said it a million times, but the expression executed in the context of the environment equals the, uh, the, the type, or is of type that type. And q has to be of type integer for this to succeed. And we only ask for one result, so we only get one result. And I'm pretty sure there's only one result anyway. So this is kind of crazy. We can, this, all this stuff I've been showing you is the same, same goal, same relation. You can see why it's so hard to name this thing, because it's not a type checker. We've seen that, it's not a type inference. It's not just a type inference, because look at this. <laughs> We can, we can substitute our expression, our second uh, argument with an unbound logic variable and ask, give me an expression that uh, when executed in the context of that environment is of type integer. And we want four of these things. So look at what we get. We get four beautiful expressions that are of type integer. The first one is g. If we go back to our environment, you can see that g is an integer. The second answer we get is applying f to g. And we've already seen that that, that is of type integer. The third, uh, the third result we get, applying f to g, apply f to that, and that returns integer. Fourth one, apply f to g, f to that, f to that. And you can see pretty quickly that there are infinite results here. So it's a good thing we only asked four, otherwise we wouldn't have anything to show on this slide. So there's one more thing I can, one more place I can put this logic variable. I can say, how, how can I extend the current environment such that applying A to B is of type float? And this is probably the only bug that has brought a smile to my face. So this is a pretty cheeky bug. So clearly what's happening is that um, our type inferencer doesn't really understand our 
uh, syntax very well. It's basically saying that if you want the expression AB to equal float, just put an environment, uh, entry in an environment where the expression AB is equal to float. <laughs> so I thought that was worth including. <laughs> I, I'm not going to fix it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and we get an actual legitimate one. So if you can imagine that Q is substituted with uh, this environment entry here, we say B is of type integer. And if you put this in here, we can kind of follow it all through. A is of type integer to float. If B is an integer and it goes here, then we get back our float and float goes there. So who's, who's seen this book? Who's read it once? Who's read it twice? I, I won't ask who wrote it, but they're just <laughs> over there. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a mind bender, but if you want to check out more of this stuff, this is definitely the first place to go. It's the reasoned schema. It's part of a series of books by Friedman, Dan, Dan Friedman. Uh, the, the first one is a real classic called Little Schema. It basically addresses uh, recursion. And Dan is a really funny guy, <laughs> very cheeky. And it brings a smile to your face that every, every page you turn. It's, it's fantastic. And there's another one called the Season Schema, I think. Uh, and the little, uh, was it the, the Java one? Oh, I forgot. The little Java something, yeah. <laughs> All amazing books. I haven't read the ML, ML, ML one. <laughs> and if you just want to get started with core logic, just Google logic starter closure, and you'll find a tutorial that's actually quite a good, oh no, th that tutorial actually plays around more with, um, with that type checker. So yeah, that, that's about it. Thank you.